Thank you, Philippe, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today. As uh, my co-chair mentioned, we have a fantastic group of speakers, and we're really looking forward to an engaging session. Feel free to post any questions as they present, and we'll try to get to those um, at the end of the session. So today we have, uh, first of all, Professor Agnes Binawaho. She is a Rwandan pediatrician who returned to Rwanda in 1996, two years after the genocide against the Tutsi. Since then, she has provided clinical care in the public sector, served the Rwandan health sector in high-level government positions, first as the Executive Secretary of Rwanda's National AIDS Control Commission, and then as Permanent Secretary of the Ministry of Health. She also served five years as Minister of Health in the country, and in addition, she co-founded the University of Global Health Equity, which is an initiative of Partners in Health that focuses on changing how healthcare is delivered around the world by training global health professionals who strive to deliver more equitable quality health services for everyone. We're very happy to have you today, Agnes. Um, next, we have Dr. Obdurfor Agnam. He is a visiting research fellow at UNUCRIS. Dr. Agnam is researching and writing a book chapter on regional health governance and also developing a capacity building proposal on African perspectives on, on global health governance and diplomacy. Prior to this position, he was deputy director and head of governance for global health at the UN University International Institute for Global Health in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, where he is now principal visitor fellow. And um, also good to mention that this is also another UN University Institute that is partner with UNU Wider and UNU Chris. He is also an adjunct professor uh, of law and legal studies at Carleton University, Canada, and visiting professor at the Institute for Future Initiatives and in University of Tokyo. Really great to have you also, Obi. And then finally, we have Dr. Roberta Andreghetti. She is a regional advisor for the international health regulations in the WHO region of the Americas. In this capacity, she oversees the application, implementation, and compliance with the international health regulations in the Americas by providing technical support to member states and also ensuring coordination with global health related activities and other international organizations. Prior to this current position, Dr. Andragetti was coordinating alert and response operations and IHR related activities in the WHO European region, as well as being a medical officer of the global alert and response team at WHO headquarters. She has coordinated and participated in responses to outbreaks related to a broad range of pathogens and also prior to his, her assignments at WHO, she worked in the Democratic Republic of Congo, Nicaragua, Spain, Uganda, and the United Kingdom. Also very great to have you, Dr. Andragetti. So um, we're going to hear from uh, three very well um, experienced uh, speakers who are going to speak from the regions where they are working and, and have worked in the past. So we have Asia, um, Africa, and the Americas represented. And uh, to start off, I think we can start with a broad question to see your views about which lessons can be drawn from the COVID-19 crisis about global health governance. And perhaps we can start with you, Agnes. Thank you, Anna, and thank you for having me. Uh, I think there are many lessons that we can learn from this pandemic. Uh, I will re I will uh, cite only three that are important for, uh, in my point of view. First of all, understand the importance of health. Health is not a commodity, and health is at the heart of economic development. Second is the SDGs uh, for health and inequities. That is sure, we are not on the path to uh, fulfill. And third is the the sad uh, lack of solidarity pushing to the reflection of the need of self-reliance. Uh, so let's, for the first one, uh, we can see how uh, COVID-19, above the fact that it has caused more than 4.5 million deaths, has disrupted all sectors, 
across the world. And the, 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 the 2020 SDGs report show us that we have we had a disruption of immunization that has never been seen since the year 70s. School has been disrupted, and when girls in some region of the world will be dropped out of school, will probably not go back to school easily. Second, our economy. Third, our economy has been absolutely um, uh, disturbed with more than 150 million people that will be pushed into poverty uh, by the end of 2021. The second big is uh, we have the inequities. COVID-19 has created no inequities, has just highlighted inequities. Inequities inside countries and inequities globally. Inside countries, we have seen that the the poorest, the vulnerable has, have been more affected, more infected and, and died more. Uh, it's the case of uh, uh, black and brown people in UK and in the US. Uh, it's the case of homeless people, uh, of people living in crowded uh, condition and the people working in informal sector in Africa. So um, the, the, the third thing is uh, the, um, uh, the fact that uh, COVID-19 has shown to the developing world that we should not rely on multilateral institutions or high-income countries. Today, we have only 3% of African uh, population that is vaccinated against more than 60% in many high-income countries. And just because, and people are vaccinated, people uh, uh, who are not at risk, uh, are thinking about a third booster when it's, there is no uh, major evidence. But uh, while people at risk in the developing countries are, are not vaccinated, we start well with the idea of COVAX based on solidarity. But COVAX was so not supported by the the countries who have uh, committed to 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 that. And today, if there is three percent people vaccinated in Africa only we have only 1.2 in the measure uh, when we put all together uh, the um, uh, the um, the people living in low in, and in, and mid, low and mid income country and we are amnesic because all what we face is with covid the world have faced it with the spanish flu lying to the population to undermine the situation and for political selfishness um poor people and vulnerable uh, dying more and uh, the lack of solidarity that has increased the magnitude and the impact of covid so those are my three lessons the importance of health the fact that inequities has been highlighted and we are very far to reach the sdgs for health and for equity and the fact that the lack of global solidarity has to put each corner of the world to try to be self uh, uh, to have self-reliance and uh, for this I mean Africa have to manufacture drugs vaccine and medical tools to, to be ready to face the next pandemic thank you Anna thank you Agnes really good reflections and a great way to kick start our conversation um, Obi what are your views about the lessons that we can draw from the crisis uh, for global health governance I think you're still muted. You click the microphone button in the bottom of the screen, you should be able to unmute. Obi, can you hear us? Uh, Maybe yeah, you should way. unmute. It, it uh, might be good to refresh your browser. That's usually the first troubleshooting option <laughs> yeah okay well perhaps while you do perhaps while he does that we can um have roberta answer the question about lessons drawn from the crisis thank you for uh, having me and uh obviously 
what have we learned? We have learned that uh, here we go again with the same set of uh, gaps, uh, with the same sets of hope and uh, hope of uh, taking corrective actions. And uh, I'm working for a multilateral organization, then we are uh, basically under the microscope, if not uh, under fire. And uh, once again, yes, we sensed that there was uh, a lot to learn from this pandemic, and we embarked uh, in this uh, deja vu of uh, lessons learning. In reality, we are identifying lessons, and uh, as WHO, we have convened three panels to look into to the COVID pandemic and okay, lessons same as with the H1N1, same with the Ebola at another magnitude. And now the set of uh, corrective measures uh, here is, are we really able to learn any lessons by putting in place, taking corrective measures? And uh, I think the good news is uh, during this pandemic is that countries, uh, despite all the lack of solidarity, inequity that this pandemic has generated, even middle income and uh, low income countries were able, in some cases unexpectedly, to take uh, the response in their own end. At least I think that what there was that learning from the side of the country of uh, really been uh, with the reality check, we cannot rely if not uh, on ourselves. And uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, we have seen major decisions uh, that were taken by national authority against, thankfully, WHO advice with respect to non-travel restriction, they shut the border, they put locked people uh, uh, down. We, and uh, for me and uh, countries uh, even they showed national authority, they showed that during the first month they were able to, to make progresses that never happened over years of commitment. And this, and this was the major, was really inspiring. And this should give confidence to the countries. And after all these panels, independent panels, whatever we have put in place at the international level. The good news is that countries, they said, look, uh, basically, we have enough of you, WHO, uh, telling us what to do. We set up uh, a member state working group to decide uh, what to take forward, what are the corrective actions uh, that we should be taking. And now, as we speak, uh, there is this uh, member state working group on the strengthening, want to see how it goes, uh, of WHO uh, in preparedness and response, and they're looking mainly at three areas, governance and leadership. And uh, what does governance mean? And they're looking to governance of WHO itself, and they are claiming a more uh, oversight and steering role uh, at the govern WHO governing bodies level. and. Uh, uh, in terms of leadership, they are even considering <laughs> some adjustment to the DG uh, position. And uh, they are looking also uh, at the uh, financing, uh, financing setup of WHO and uh, uh, technical tool. Oh, and this is a very good news that there was this ownership taken by county. I really hope that it's taken forward. And, uh, but at the same time, the same group of countries, like uh, the ones that Agnes was uh, referring to, under other umbrella, like the G7, the G20, they're organizing uh, uh, and they're shaping and visualizing a different uh, um, global uh, architecture for a preparedness and response. Then uh, now the challenge is, uh, can we have governance without leadership? Can we have a parallel uh, leadership uh, and governance uh, mechanism for uh, public health preparedness and response? And we saw how we ended up this time with uh, inequity, lack of solidarity. Uh, and this, uh, I don't know, this is an issue. I, I don't know, maybe something that we should not learn. And uh, this is my contribution. Thank you.
Thank you, Roberta. Really great points about the importance of country ownership, but also how can we stop just learning and learning, but actually implementing change. And uh, I'm sure later on we'll have more of an exchange about also the role of WHO and this point you bring up about parallel leadership in global health. Um, Obi, I don't know if you if you have what are your views are in terms of. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear okay. you. All right. Great. Okay. I I refresh. Sorry about that. No I problem. I was, uh, yeah. Okay. Um. I in the because there's we have um, uh, the time is quite limited and. Um, I really would want to re-echo uh, some of the most of the points that uh, Agnes made, but maybe from a different uh, perspective. Um, the uh, the future of global health governance uh, in the context of the crisis that we face, you know, the of today, the COVID uh, crisis, um, reflects, uh, in my view, um, what most uh, scholars, you know, have been writing about in the since the nineties about the need for a transition. Uh, from international governance to global governance, there are two different things. You know, when we talk about international governance, it, it means the the state centric Westphalian institution, uh, where nation states are members of the UN or WHO, and you know all of these intergovernmental processes. But um, because of the fact that you know the um, 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 uh, the concept of the globalization of public health, which in the context of infectious diseases, disrespects the boundaries of nation states. Um, the CIS pathogens don't respect national boundaries, they don't respect geopolitical territories, they don't carry national passports, they crisscross the globe. And, um, you know, when this argument is made, I think the world was quite caught on our way because nobody believed that, uh, that a virus, you know, um, in this day and age, um, is, will be capable of shutting the entire world, east, west, north and south, okay? Um, if you look at uh, you know bacteria infections, the um, the emergence of antibiotics you know uh, gave the world you know a whole lot of uh, false hope that you know we've grown beyond you know uh, what we're witnessing today, where a virus would emerge and shut the entire world. So so the point uh, um, that needs to be re strongly emphasized is the fact that because we have such a high level of betrayal of trust. The, uh, this has led to collapse of global health governance. And um, um, in the context of the world that we live in, the world of today, where, uh, as Agnes mentioned, only a very tiny portion of populations in Africa and under, under developing, under, on, on other developing uh, regions have access to um, uh, available COVID vaccines. Um, what has happened you know, to the bridges that we need to build you know, across all of humanity, you know? So that's that's one question. Can enlightened self-interest drive global health diplomacy where we, we, we place a premium on every human life? It doesn't matter whether this life is Latin America, in the Caribbean, in Sub-Saharan Africa, in Southeast Asia, in Europe. So these are the questions. How do we actually, you know, uh, 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 rebuild, you know, uh, trust in global health governance? And doing this would entail uh, intergovernmental institutions, um, international governmental institutions, um, collaborating, you know, with non-state actors. There's no way, you know, we can um, uh, leave this this uh, this um, uh, job, you know, for uh, UN um, um, uh, the UN system, for instance, as Philip mentioned. Um, so you need to step outside. And then today we're talking about vaccines. There are serious questions about research and development. Okay, um, this is these are goods produced in the, by the private sector, and questions about intellectual property, questions about patents, and once you patent a product, you and I know what is going to happen. You know the next thing is profit maximization. Okay, so corporations don't actually, they they they, they are primary, uh, you know, uh, uh, primary stakeholders, are their shareholders. They want to make sure that you know business is good. And um, there's no charity, really. Uh, she mentioned COVAX. COVAX, the, one of the mistakes we can make in global health governance is to, is, to, uh, uh, is to subject the lives of hundreds of millions of people to, um, to um, a governance that is built on charity. Okay? It's pure charity. 
So we donate, you know, vaccines that we don't need. And in the context of what has happened, you know, uh, again, uh, with respect to the COVID mechanism, when we had three major vaccines, you know, in the West, say in North America, Canada, US, most of Europe, and there were safety issues about AstraZeneca, for instance. Um, so most of the countries were, you know, going for Pfizer and for Moderna. Okay, uh, in the U.S., Johnson and Johnson is not yet fully approved. But what you haven't approved for your citizens, you want to send to, you know, some developing part of the world, you know, and then because they don't have any option, you know, they either take this or they lose it. So, so these are some of the ethical questions that we need to ask, and asking these questions would need to bring, you know, um, intergovernmental institutions together on the table with non-state actors. And that is when we have to begin to build um, an effective global health governance mechanism that addresses the needs of the most vulnerable people in developing countries, okay? Um, so the second point uh, that is related to this is the fact that the, um, the, uh, the, the COVID crisis, like Agnes uh, mentioned, um, is not just a health issue. There's now series and series of reports and research that has come out in the past one year uh, that persuasively point to the fact that um, is, we're now facing a triple crisis in so many countries, okay? COVID has, first of all, most is a health crisis. Secondly, it has reversed most of the gains that are made in prodigation of uh, extreme poverty, which is the most important SDG, okay? And the climate crisis, in so many countries has also complicated the you know the, the the rising debt so you have you know a triple crisis now facing most of the underdeveloped and developing countries the lower middle income countries so how do you how do we actually you know uh, uh reverse you know this trend because it's, it's not only there's, there's a report there's a, a research that was done by the um the um the Kamasha foundation um in Uppsala which is very persuasive. I mean, I can send the, the links, you know, to, to that, you know. So if you read that, you see where uh, they've done excellent studies in countries, in Africa, in Latin America, in the Caribbean, in Southeast Asia, showing how, you know, the impact of COVID on uh, the SDGs, you know, there's now a, 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 a reversal of some of the goals, some of the gains based on some of those goals. So, um, so the, I want to conclude by saying that um, one of the lessons we've learned is that you know um, all the stakeholders, nation states, international organizations, non-state actors, the global philanthropic community, uh, they have to we have to sit down and think about you know how to build bridges, to build back trust in global health governance, to inject the principles of you know enlightened self-interest in global health diplomacy. It is lacking at the moment, and we need to revisit that. Thank you very much. Um, I'm looking at my watch also, and I see the time is, is progressing. I think we have time for a second round of, of uh, exchanges, but I would suggest that we use this time to do two things at the same time. I think uh, you can use the, the time that is remaining to react to, to your colleagues or to comment on, on what the other uh, panelists uh, were saying. But at the same time, it would also be good if you could address uh, the, our second uh, question, which is a bit more specific, uh, which was about the role that regional organizations uh, could play, should play, have been playing, have not been playing in, during this crisis. So it would be good also to, to, to have your view on, on this, uh, the role of that regional level, I mean, the super regional, the supranational regional level within the overall architecture. I know that Roberta has some critical views about this. We have been talking about this yesterday, but uh, perhaps we can start with Agnes again and uh, first, and uh, so that we hear her views on on the African regional uh, organizations and and their role uh, that they are playing or should be playing, according to uh, Agnes. Please. Thank you, Philip. Uh, I think that uh, the regional organizations are crucial. And I just want to say that Africa should think about which one is good for Africa. And this pandemic has shown us that CDC Africa was our best ally. 
even last uh, uh, pandemic uh, when uh, of Ebola that killed 11,000 people, the first reaction globally came from African Union. So African Union has now a strong CDC, Africa CDC, and us in Africa, we should develop and follow that. It's good for global health security. I no longer count on the Western world to help me. No, they will let me die. I know that I've seen that. So I will be saved by what is there in Africa, having a strong say on the table to say this to do, this is not to do. So global health security can be achieved by no country alone, no region alone, because even now by blocking Africa to get access to vaccine, or other low-income country, we are going to have variant that will respond to no vaccine and the rich country will die again. So not following science, um, as it has been said now, and even not following WHO advice, we are going to pay that, uh, pay that very highly. Second, regional um, entities like African Union or CDC Africa will help regulate I want to recall that the first the, there was a meeting of African Ministry of Health at the first case in Africa under the leadership of CDC and the continent as one decided to go uh, for the, 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 the good measure. And that's why Africa has not been so much, um, has behaved well. And it's something that I'm very happy to have seen that Africa can count on itself to pass through a catastrophe like, like uh, this one. Don't forget that they were expecting 10, 10 million uh, deaths in Africa and, and the destruction of everything. This was the Western uh, provision. This, the, so governance, uh, regulations, and support of each country regionally, and also uh, um, help procure and distribution of uh, uh, medical tools that will save the population in Africa. Without CDC, you know that even when we put money on the table, Western manufacturer was even not considered our orders. And even now, with the vaccine, we have paid AstraZeneca, we have paid Pfizer, 3.4 million doses we pay to Pfizer as a country, and we are still served after Western countries who put their order after us. So. Ordering, distribution, manufacturing, regulation, governance, yes, regional entities are needed. But the weakness of WHO is that WHO is not backed by head of state. CDC Africa is directly backed by head of state. WHO should, because Minister of Health are there. But let me tell you, I have been a Minister of Health and my colleagues, most of them doesn't report to the country when they go to Geneva for a meeting. CDC Africa, they report directly to the Assembly of Head of State. So we should revisit the global architecture of governance to serve better the people. Thank you. Thank you. Um, shall we continue with uh, Obi? Yes, um, um, just uh, again, in the interest of time, um, I wanted to comment on the African CDC, but Agnes has done that uh, um, uh, most excellently. Um, but just one thing uh, to, to uh, re echo the fact that um, it was just uh, the Africa CDC was a product of the lessons from Ebola. Okay. Um, and instead of uh, we know what happened in Sierra Leone, Liberia, Guinea, and uh, the fact that um, WHO was very slow in responding to those emergencies um, in those three post-conflict countries um, and uh, didn't uh, declare Ebola a public health emergency of international concern uh, almost uh, over eight months after uh, what happened uh, in those countries uh, took place. So the Africa CDC basically is um, a very good candidate, you know, in terms of uh, galvanizing support um, in the context of what the WHO DG himself, Dr. Tedros, has called the uh, vaccine apartheid, you know, to, I'm just quoting him, that's what he, he used that term when he was addressing the G20 uh, summit, that we now have uh, a you know, vaccine apartheid um, um, with respect to, you know, uh, limited access to different uh, regions of the world. So in the context of this, you know, vaccine nationalism versus vaccine protectionism, um, a regional institution like the Africa CDC 
can actually be, you know, be, be strengthened by African governments um, to address this lacuna, you know, the gap in, you know, uh, in, um, uh, in access, you know, um, to, to vaccines. Um, you cannot just start producing vaccines overnight, okay? This is something that takes, you know, time in terms of putting in place the infrastructure. But uh, when the vision is there, and there's the political will of, you know, uh, the uh, 54 African countries, um, we can actually, you know, uh, uh, begin that journey. And I think the, uh, in terms of uh, the way that uh, I've read most of the things that the Africa CDC is doing um, on the policy plank uh, is off to an excellent start. And I think, you know, again, you know, we, sometimes we learn from crisis. So maybe this COVID crisis, maybe the lessons from, from this vaccine apartheid um, um, is now galvanizing it, you know, to even do more or to, you know, to, um, to, uh, to put it, uh, its, uh, its house in order in terms of um, looking into the potential, the future, you know, uh, the present and the future uh, 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 global health crisis. Um, one other thing uh, I also want to make, the point I also want to make about the Africa CDC is that uh, we've got this, maybe Roberto will talk about that, you know, that's our area, uh, the international health regulations, uh, which um, I was fortunate, you know, when I was at WHO in 1999, um, I was part of the team that drafted the, the IHL 2005 under the, the leadership of uh, David Herman, who was then the head of uh, WHO infectious disease uh, 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 cluster. So um, the, 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 the concept of uh, you know, declaring a, 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 an outbreak, a public health emergency of international concern, um, was a, a novel idea at that time. You know, it was seen as a radical idea. You know, in, the 19, in 1999 to 2001, when we were toying with you know, uh, this draft of the new IHL. Um, but it's become, since 2005, the major regulatory tool that WHO has Yes, there's a lot of uh, criticism of the IHR uh, by the independent um, panels that have been set up uh, since uh, COVID. Um, but uh, rules are rules. You know, if you have treaties or, you know, frameworks or, or, or regulations, it, they can provide everything, okay? So we have to have some form of space within those regulations for the WHO authority, the DG, for instance, to be able to convene the, his scientific advisors to assess a situation and make a decision whether you know to declare that particular outbreak a uh, public health emergency of international concern and this is where the africa cdc is actually if you look at the vision um there's a link okay so whatever is happening at the international at the uh, at the level of uh, who the ihr mechanisms cannot effectively be linked with the policy framework of the africa cdc in terms of building surveillance in terms of building the capacity for 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 health security within the continent, so um, so I see this synergy, you know, and I think it's a very important thing, you know, to have um, the synergy between the vision of the Africa CDC and the the WHO's international health regulations, and it's something that I think should be supported in order to you know to enrich the capacity of regional institutions to be able to um, you know to uh, to to achieve their mandates. Thank you very much. Uh, and then, uh, Roberta, it's uh, your turn. And the final word in this round. Thank you. Now, regarding the role of uh, regional organizations, uh, I'm, now, I'm now sitting in an office in a region which uh, praise, is very proud of the Pan-Americanisms, uh, but uh, Paradoxically, since uh, I've been here, uh, I've seen all these moving parts of sub-regional uh, economic integration mechanisms popping up in the Americas. Uh, and uh, I can't even keep track of how many I've seen uh, uh, emerging, disappearing, uh, reshaping. And um, this because uh, we in the different regions of the world we have a very different level of maturity uh, and governance which are underpinning the, these mechanisms we go from an eu-like situation with all the defects that we know to a situation like the americas where uh, every other day we have something new popping up and uh, when we talk to the countries uh, 
the answer the answer uh, the quest uh, the answer is always ah we have to have a sub-regional approach a regional approach and then uh, i say but what how do you characterize a sub-regional approach in terms of preparedness and response radio silence then we are in this situation where we are dealing de facto primarily with uh, political uh, entities uh, and uh, uh, these political entities that uh, in uh, at times uh, of crisis uh, they step uh, into technical ground uh, and uh, as an organization we are interacting on technical issues with political entities uh, and uh, we, we are in the situation of substitutions uh, we end up in uh, comp uh, competing uh, for uh, resources uh, and uh, um, it's really really hard to understand where the complementarity between multilateralism and sub-regional uh, entities is at least in this region of the americas in europe i can see the role of the EU, the type of the interaction that the EU has. In Africa, I can see that there is a unique technical institution like the uh, African CDC under the African Union that has a certain role. But here in this region of the Americas with all this Pan-Americanism, paradoxically, we have all these bits and pieces, these mosaics of uh, changing uh, institutions and is really really hard and i've been here in this region 10 years basically and at the end i've always been with this wall of radio silence what does it mean and uh having to sort of uh, stepping in um in terms of a regional approach yes we have all learned uh, the hard way as agnes and uh, obvious said that I think a, a good, uh, we can call it like that, outcome of this crisis is that uh, uh, now countries in the Americas, uh, the uh, South America, uh, Central and South Americas and the Caribbean, they are uh, engaging into a long, medium, long-term um, process to establish the manufacturing capacity for vaccines and other medical supplies. And uh, it's not the first time that uh, there is this attempt of uh, self-sufficiency, establishing self-sufficiency, let's see how it goes. But at least this seems a solid a step forward with solid foundation. I can only keep my fingers crossed. Thank you, over. Thank you very much. Uh, I think indeed that there is there is on the one hand a, a good case that can be made indeed for for for, for this regional uh, uh, approaches um, um, when when the issue is is cross border is about uh, communicable diseases is is related to the mobility of people. I think there is a, a good case to be made for for regional action. Also, what uh, Agnes also mentioned, also at the level of, of the production of medicines, vaccines in this case, uh, infrastructures and so on. I think there is also a good case to be made, I mean, from a, from a normative perspective. But I also agree with R Roberta, of course, that the, the reality of, of, of regional institutions is very different from one region to the other. Eh? And in some cases, there is indeed a sort of natural uh, leadership uh, that exists uh, at the level of one uh, relatively or, or strong uh, regional institution, whereas in other regions, there is it's not the case. There are overlapping organizations with overlapping mandates, which are, as you say, uh, often at, at, in addition, rather political than technical, and and so uh, which of course makes it, it much more complex. And, and also then, from your perspective, and the PAHO in. in Okay, I think it's a, it must be a challenge indeed also then to engage with these organizations. Um, so no, thank you very much for for your insights. I'm yeah, I, I I'm watching my my clock again, and uh, unfortunately, I think we we have come to, to the end of, of this session already. It's a pity. I think we could we could go on for for uh, for another hour, but uh, I think the final session is immediately following this one. So. Um, 
what we could do, and uh, can, we will talk with Anna about this, what we could do is try to to, to draw some conclusions from this session and perhaps put it in, in, in writing also so that people who were not able to attend uh, this session could also, let's say, uh, have, a, have an idea of, of, let's say, the conclusions and then the ideas that were uh, circulated here. I don't know whether, Anna, you want to add something uh, at this point? Uh, well, I just want to thank our speakers and the audience as well. I, I think when we organized this, we suspected we would have a very rich discussion. And as you say, we could have kept going. But uh, my final thoughts are really we've been discussing the complexity of global health governance, the inequities that have been uncovered by COVID-19, and also the differences between regions in terms of how um, regional organizations, uh, the work takes place and the difficulties of trying these uh, collective actions within regions. Uh, I just want to thank everyone again and we will be in touch. I hope we can at least draft the main conclusions from this panel together or organize another one and continue the discussion. Bye-bye. Thank you very much to all the panelists.